John Bostic for this hit yesterday on Andy Dalton that earned him an ejection from the game. This was Dalton's first concussion of his career. Went out of the game. He's now in concussion protocol. And if he can't start on Sunday, that would mean Ben DiNucci is going to start against the Philadelphia Eagles. And the Cowboys will monitor and test Dalton all through the week. But Bostic will not be suspended. Adam Schefter back throughout the show, including a report on Odell Beckham Jr., who confirmed he tore his ACL, will miss the remainder of the season. Welcome to NFL Live. You just saw him, Dan Orlovsky, Mina Kimes, Marcus Spears here. About four hours to kick off of Monday Night Football. We'll have a report from Los Angeles coming your way soon. And let's get right to it, Dan. Let's go to a battle of unbeatens. The Steelers taking on the Titans. This one coming down to the wire. We pick it up in the fourth quarter. A little over a minute left here. The Titans are down 27 to 24. Ryan Tannehill connecting with A.J. Brown. It's a great route. It's perfect for stack coverage with the trailing corner underneath. Outstanding timing. Tannehill leads him to the sideline. Huge completion for this offense late in the game. Yes, yeah, so now the Titans in field goal range. So all Steven Gostkowski's got to do is attempt the 46 yards. Go yard straight. Get it. But just, just go straight. Don't say Oh, no. Wide right. He obviously not happy about that big Ben. He can't believe it, but the Steelers win 27 to 24. They stay unbeaten, and so the Steelers move to just 6 and 0. They've scored at least 25 points in each of their victories. I shouldn't say just 6 and 0. It's 6 and 0. It's amazing. They're just the eighth team in NFL history to do that, with nearly sure. half of those previous teams going on to reach to the Camby Super Bowl. And their defense is making all the noise. But this offense putting up points also leads the league in average time of possession thus far. So Dan, how has Ben Roth? Roethlisberger reworked his style since coming back from injury. Yeah, I mean, if you watch Big Ben for the first 15 years of his career, one of the things that you would say was, like, he just held the ball too long. Like, he was always trying to make plays. And if you watch Big Ben this year, it's the complete opposite. It's ball out of his hand as quickly as possible. Now, in third down, it's certainly he's still capable to make some of those plays. Like, hey, Ben, we got to have you go back in time for this third down situation. That happens. But other than that, it's like catch, throw, catch, throw, distributed football to Deontay Johnson or Eric Ebron or Juju Smith-Schuster. And so when you play against them, they're very difficult to match up against because if you're playing defense against the Steelers, it's like, okay, do we have – Five really good players to match up against them. Yeah. I mentioned Juju, Deontay Johnson, it's Eric Ebron, it's Chase Claypool, it's a tailback. Like, do you have enough people to match up against them? And now if you flip it and you got to play offensive football against them, right, against that defense, it's like we're going to punch you in the face. And so you have to be an incredibly physical offense. We watched the most physical offense in the AFC yesterday, Tennessee, for the most part get goose-egged against them. Mm. Like, that defense shut them down. That's why they're such a difficult matchup. You usually don't have enough people to play against defense against them, and you've got to have the mentality to play offense against them. Dan, you know what strikes me about those Steelers wide receivers when you were listing them? How perfect they are for Ben Roethlisberger at this stage of his career, okay. right? I think sometimes yeah. when we try to rank receivers, we forget how much it matters which quarterback they're playing with. For example, DK Metcalf, perfect with Russell Wilson. Tyreek Hill, perfect with Patrick Mahomes. And as you said, Ben Roethlisberger, he's not really throwing it deep. He's getting the ball out super quickly. 2.05 seconds per throw yesterday, by the way, which is bonkers. And his receivers are generating yards after the catch, third mm -hmm. most in the NFL right now. And every week, it's a different guy, right? Like Chase Claypool has a huge week a few weeks ago. Yesterday, he's mostly a decoy. Deontay Johnson, he's this incredibly crisp route runner. He was huge in the first half. Juju Smith-Schuster becomes a safety valve in the second half. They're able to change it based on what kind of matchups they're getting, and that's what makes this offense so difficult to defend. Marcus, when we talk about that division, you've been on the Ravens all summer. Now, with you seeing what, what Pittsburgh is doing, are you still on the Ravens? Oh, I was teetering. Come I was on. almost Come there, on. but I'm not. I'm going to stay with Baltimore. <laughs> Listen, Pittsburgh is doing a tremendous job. And look, undefeated team, this defensively, they are make, giving people nightmares. The only person I see in this league that can take advantage, and there are some plays to be had. Look, the Titans made a lot of those plays that were to be had against this Pittsburgh defense. The aggressiveness sometimes against guys like Lamar Jackson can cost you big and can turn into huge plays. That's from an offensive standpoint when I'm talking about Baltimore. Now, obviously, they've struggled a bit offensively, but I think they'll continue to get better, get that corrected. This game is coming up soon, so he'll have his opportunity to take advantage of those blitzers. And then on the other side of the ball, listen, 
for as much as we love and talk about Pittsburgh and Tampa Bay, you know who else is playing damn defense? Mm. The Baltimore Ravens are, like they continuously do every single year. I think the Kansas City game made people kind of reevaluate if this team was for real or not, including myself. But when you think about how they play football, what Dan just talked about with Pittsburgh, smash mouth. They want to play a close inline of scrimmage type game. The Pittsburgh Steelers are right for that. And being getting the ball out of his hand is great. But Marcus Peters is back there. Humphreys is back there. This is an outstanding matchup. So I'm going to yeah. stay on the side of the Baltimore Ravens, even though I was close to going to Pittsburgh, else. Our guy stands pat. And, guys, the Steelers started 6-0 and just one other time in franchise history. That was 1978 when, of course, they went on to win the Super Bowl 13 over the Cowboys. We're just getting started on NFL Live. OBJ gets hurt and Baker balls out. Stay tuned to find Find out why that may not be a coincidence. More on the Browns coming your way on NFL Live and some good news to report here on the show. Washington head coach Ron Rivera has officially ended his last round of cancer treatment. Check out this moment as he left the hospital today. Monday countdown setting the table for week seven in this finale as the Bears head to Los Angeles to take on the Rams in Monday night football. Our coverage starts at 6 Eastern right here on ESPN. And then later on, the game at 8, Nick Foles and that entire Bears offense trying to figure out how to stop Aaron Donald. So for more on this matchup, let's check in at the Domino's pregame headquarters where Lisa Salters is standing by. Lisa, Donald not alone in his dominance as a defender tonight. Tell us about two guys who can make quarterbacks regret their career choice. Laura, tonight we have that rare NFL game where the headliner for both teams plays on defense. Bears linebacker Khalil Mack and Rams defensive tackle Aaron Donald were both first round picks in 2014 and have combined to win three of the last four NFL Defensive Player of the Year awards. When we asked Donald about going up against Mack, he said he isn't really looking at the game that way, but he did say that he always wants to put on a show and wants to outplay everyone else on the field. Khalil Mack was listed as questionable for this game and missed some practice time this week because of back soreness. But according to head coach Matt Nagy, he is good to go tonight, as is defensive end Akeem Hicks, who missed back-to-back -back practices this week because of illness. Hicks told me he was congested, had a bit of a sore throat, and was kept away from the team because of COVID protocols. But all he had, he said, was a common cold. Laura. We'll see in about three hours and 45 minutes. That's when Monday Night Football kicks off. And, Mina, you've watched tons of film on this Bears defense. You just heard what Lisa reported about them being at full strength. What are you seeing, though, out of this Bears D? They're really fun to watch. Yeah. I mean, it, there is a lot of bad defensive play around the NFL right now. Uh, but the Bears are one of the bright spots, and they're why they're winning games. They're also good in a way that equips them to stop a lot of the league's best quarterbacks because they can get pressure without a blitz. They can get pressure out front with four. Yes, you'll hear a lot about Khalil Mack, but Robert Quinn is doing work. A couple of uh, Teddy Bridgewater's picks came off of stunts run with Quinn and Bilal Nichols, who's also good. Of course, Keem Hicks. Meanwhile, in the secondary, this is one of the more disciplined units in the NFL. They are so well coached, Laura. They play a variety of coverages. They don't make a lot of mental mistakes. They're phenomenal. However, they have a flaw. And unfortunately, it's a flaw that lines up with the, what the Rams do really well, which is they're soft against the run. Now, part of the reason why the Rams offense looks so good this year and looks actually similarly to how they looked in 2018 is because they are running the ball extremely well. On first down, they're averaging 5.45 yards per mm. carry. Not good for defenses. <laughs> so I wouldn't be surprised if the Rams come out with a run-heavy script. And to me, that's the ball game right there. If the Bears can get Jared Goff into obvious passes, Passing situations, I think they have the advantage. But if the Rams can stay ahead and run the football well, they'll have the edge. Yeah, Mina mentioned uh, some of those guys up front that could get pressure on the quarterback. But on the back end, Kyle Fuller, Eddie Jackson, Jalen Johnson, the rookie, has been phenomenal this year as well. So they, they have guys on every level. To Mina's point, you can take advantage of Trevathan and Roquan Smith. But the bottom line is this. This team is built – the way the NFL wants to be built. Now, when you talk about getting teams to third and long, third and five or more, and I play with guys like that, there's usually special packages, guys that you change, interchange. You bring a group off the field, you bring a group on. 
Well, Chicago has three down players. And Akeem Hicks and Robert Quinn and Khalil Mack and Bacavius Mingo, who comes in every once in a while, they all can get to the quarterback and win one-on-ones. That's the thing we talk about with the team that we're ta- that they're playing, with the Rams. Aaron Donald finds matchups. Chicago doesn't have to move a lot to find matchups. They got every guy can, can beat one-on-ones. All right, so I don't think that Jared Goff is watching our show right now, Dan, but, you know, if he is, he might be thinking, well, what am I going to do against this Bears defense? So what does this all mean for Goff tonight? He should be. I was trying to find – I asked Mina to give me a good analogy here, and she failed me, so I'm using my analogy. The Bears defense is like, you know, one of those credit card companies. Like, there's hidden fees everywhere. Like, they're not going to give you anything free. All right, did that one hit? Not really. All right, so yeah. all right, makes sense. there's nothing free with this it. defense. Like every yard you have to go earn, especially in the pass game, because in the pass game you're always looking as a play caller like, okay, who on the defense can I go attack or what part of the scheme can I go attack? Yeah. And there's nothing in the Bears defense that you go, yeah, you know what, there's the guy. I can get free yardage out of the guy because there's really good defenses that will give you free yards. You know, like – Last year, San Francisco, they'll give you free completions. Indy, this year, they'll give you free completions. The Chargers, they'll give you some free yards. The Chicago Bears, they don't. Like, you got to earn every yard and every completion. So, Jared Goff tonight, he's got to break the huddle and knowing, like, all right, I got to be at my absolute best with where I am in the pocket, the timing of my throw. I got to know that I'm going to get beat up a little bit because everything's going to be difficult. That's what makes this Bears defense so good. Yeah, um, if you're a, a quarterback, you're like, oh, no, prayers for my completion percentage against the Bears. They're holding opponents to a 57.1 completion percentage this season. That's the best mark in the NFL. Unfortunate news for the Browns to get to now with OBJ. And the wide receiver tore his ACL yesterday against the Bengals, expected to miss the remainder of the 2020 season. Adam Schefter with us. What do we know, Adam, about Beckham's prognosis? Listen, Laura, he said today himself that he's got a torn ACL. He will not play again this season. He turns 28 years old in a few weeks here, and you have to think here, will he be ready for training camp next year? Will he be ready for the start of the season? That's the trajectory that we now have to start thinking about with Odell Beckham Jr. Again, training camp opens in about nine months. The season opens in about 10 or 11 months, and these injuries usually take about a year, and sometimes it takes two years before a player really regains his full form or form. So it's going to be a challenge for Odell Beckham Jr. to come back from this, but I'm sure he's up to it, and the work begins here fairly soon for him. Yeah, especially a guy at that type of skill position, it can certainly be difficult for them to fully recover. We'll keep our eye on that. But how is this absence of OBJ going to affect this Browns offense? Well, the Mayfield-Beckham Jr. connection didn't really click in year two. Mayfield completing just 55% of his attempts to OBJ this season compared to a rate of 79% to all other wide receivers. It's kind of shocking. Notice, too, the drastic difference in Mayfield's QBR by target, too. So it's something, Dan, not working necessarily with OBJ and, yeah. and with Baker Mayfield. First of all, how does that happen? And then mm. secondly, do you think it really is going to impact this Browns offense without OBJ? You know, I experienced something like this with Matthew Stafford and Calvin Johnson in Detroit. Now, they had a lot more success together, but it was like this commitment to always find a way to get him the ball. With Baker Mayfield and OBJ, it's like this. Baker Mayfield gets his play call, and his immediate first thought with a- OBJ on the field is, where's OBJ? What's o- OBJ's route? And then it goes to, all right, this is my play versus the defense. Now, if you take Odell off the field, his thought process goes, okay, what's my call? What's the defense? And he just lets the play operate itself, and he throws to the guy that gets open. The first play of the game the other day is the perfect example. Like, they have a, a curl flat route to his left versus cover three defense. That play is built. It was designed to beat the cover three defense. And he's got Odell on his right, and he's going to run a go route. The only reason he would throw the Odell the go route is because it's press coverage. The corner's off 10 yards, and he just throws it to Odell just because Odell had a go route. And then, like, 20 plays later, they have the same call, and he just operates the play with Odell off the field. And I think that's the thing is Baker gets so consumed or had, had such the, the willingness or want to, all right, Odell's got this route. It doesn't necessarily matter what the play is. I want to throw this ball to Odell. When Odell's off the field, he goes, you know what? The play is the play. And I'm just going to operate it versus what the defense is giving me. So, listen, the reality is Odell's still a playmaker. And so the the offense will miss his playmaking ability. But at the end of the day, we we can't run from the fact that Baker operates better. And Baker operates more efficiently with Odell Beckham not in his 
thought process as a receiver. And that's crazy to say, but it's the truth. It goes against the grain of what you would right. think. And many said one of the strengths of that Browns offense would be all the weapons that they Matthew had. Matthew struggled with it in Detroit. Like, I, and once, once Calvin <laughs> retired, Matthew got to an understanding of like, there's five or six guys that I can throw the ball to, and I'm good enough just to throw it to that person. Yeah, it's not necessarily OBJ's fault or anything right. like that. All right, we'll keep our eye on that. But you know what time it is. Stay tuned to find out who makes this week's edition of Big Man Ballin' with the Big Swagoo. Marcus got a little surprise up his... Who's with a fighting spirit? Back here on NFL Live with Adam Schefter. Adam, some week seven injuries to update us on, beginning with Cardinals running back Kenyon Drake. Laura, he's undergoing an MRI this afternoon on an ankle that he injured last night. And I have a sense that it's not going to be good when the results come back. The x-rays at the stadium last night were negative. That was encouraging. But the MRI will tell the full story. You can see how much pain Drake was in at that point last night when he went down. Obviously a difficult injury to have to bounce back from. Chris Carson has what Pete Carroll is now describing as a mid-foot sprain. Not ideal for a big, physical running back the way that Chris Carson runs. If he can't play, then Carlos Hyde would step in and fill that role. And Jacksonville Jaguars running back Raquel Armstead is not expected to play again this season due to being hospitalized twice, suffering, suffering multiple complications from his bout with coronavirus. He's been on the COVID list twice, two different times. And while many players have bounced right off the reserve COVID-19 list. That has not been the case this season with Raquel Armstead. There may not be a player in football who's been more affected this season than this particular player. And a couple other Jaguar notes, they activated Aaron Lynch and placed D.D. Westbrook on injured reserve today. All right, we will see you, Adam Schefter, with the Monday Night Countdown crew. That coming your way on ESPN at 6 Eastern. Thanks for being with us here. Thank you. And Will. the Cardinals showed the fighting spirit last night, trailing by as many as 10 in the second half. And Dan Orlovsky, we pick it up with about 38 seconds left in the game, and Cardinals down by three. Kyler Murray able to take it by himself. A great use of the quarterback draw, but watch Fitz. Like, this is huge because look at the clock. The clock is going to be the enemy right now. Every second matters when you're trying to get down there and getting the ball back to the official and spotted is huge. Now this is Edmonds running the ball. Now look at Fitz coming again. Now watch Chase Edmonds and how far behind he is. That's a difference of three or four seconds right there. Fitz's hustle gets the ball spiked at two seconds left. Without that, that game never comes down to this kick. Zane Gonzalez with a chance for redemption, and he gets just that after missing one before that from 44 yards out. We're headed to overtime. The Seahawks with the ball at second and 10. Russell Wilson with an opportunity, but a pick by Isaiah Simmons, the Clemson product, able to get that one and just dropping straight back like he knew exactly what was coming. Dan is going to break down that exact moment and why it was so important a little bit later. So the Cardinals able to take the position a few plays later, Gonzalez with a chance to win it. He does just that, nails it from 48 yards out, and the Cardinals win 37-34 in overtime, handing Seattle their first loss of the season. I'm sorry, Mina, she looked very sad Her over there. Face. We'll hear from you in a moment. But, Dan, the unsung hero of the game was on the Cardinals' sideline last night. How did their D coordinator, Vance Joseph, put his fingerprints in the outcome? Yeah, you used the phrase unsung hero, and it's perfect because the way that he fooled one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL, Russell Wilson, was so impressive. It's a three-play sequence. I want everyone to see seven people up at the line of scrimmage. Those DBs are off at about 10 yards each because those, that pressure is coming. Now, Seattle's got seven guys protecting and still can't get home. Russell Wilson feels it, throws it away. Very next play, they're going to show you the same exact look. Seven guys up again. Now there's that cat and mouse game. The DBs are about 10 yards off again. Russell Wilson's thinking, all right, here comes that same pressure again. Got to get the ball out. Whack! In completion, very next play, Vance Joseph goes, all right, here it comes. I'm going to show you the seven guys up. Russell Wilson's going, all right, here comes that all-out pressure. i got to get this ball out of my hands super quickly. But what Vance Joseph does is goes, nope, I'm going to drop four guys out from the line of scrimmage and not blitz. Russell Wilson, catch throw. Oh, I did not have any idea that Isaiah Simmons was going to be the blowout dropper there, and that results into that interception. Vance Joseph was great. I'll show you something on first down. I'll show you something on second down. Third down, I'm thinking, same thing's coming. It's worked two plays in a row, and Vance jo Joseph goes, I'm a step ahead. And he fooled the best playing quarterback, yeah. at least the hottest quarterback in the NFL right now. 
You're so right to single out uh, that sequence, uh, Dan, because the contrast between what you saw there from the Cardinals' defense and then what you saw from the Seahawks' defense on the final two drives that led to field goals really proved to be the difference in the game. And Russell Wilson, he's probably not going to make those kinds of mental mistakes again, per se. But the stat you're hearing all day is that Seattle only pressured Kyler once on 48 dropbacks. We know that pass rush is basically non-existent. Some of that uh, was intentional, by the way. They were trying to just keep him in front because they were so afraid of him taking off. But what bothered me so much watching Seattle on the final two drives was that you just saw nothing from them. They softened up. It was like they didn't acknowledge the fact that all Arizona needed was a field goal. They were letting him throw, you know, short passes in front of them. They were keeping the ball in front of them. Meanwhile, on the other side of the football, you saw some creativity from an Arizona defensive line that's not more talented Mm -hmm. than Seattle. They just outcoached them, as Mm. you described. It came down to the creativity of the play calling, not the talent. Okay, y'all. Picture this, and this might be so far left field, but let me make the caveat first. <laughs> this is why you. This is why we talk about Khalil Mack, Aaron Donald, and guys like we do for these particular situations. And Seattle missed Jadavian Clowney last night. And I'm going to tell you, because when you're in these two-minute situations, we had a guy when I was in Dallas, DeMarcus Ware, go get the quarterback. Mm. Make him get off of his spot. Change up the play, make the quarterback uncomfortable on every single throw. And when you don't yeah. have that guy, and we've talked about it. We talked about it with Jadavian going into the Steelers game. He doesn't bring guys to the ground with the sack numbers. But the one thing Jadavian does is pressures the quarterback mm. yeah. from an individual standpoint. And Seattle did not have that guy last night for that particular situation. That was the first time that I thought about, okay, He asked for a tremendous amount of money, obviously, and they didn't want to pay him that. But when you look at those particular situations, that's exactly the guy you need is to get guys off the spot. So that's the first thing that came to mind when Kyler was dealing it. Kyler might evade it anyway and ran for some yards, but you have to have. Hey, NFL teams, you have to have a player to get quarterbacks off the spot when they are trying to make a drive to either tie the game or win the football game. And Seattle had that in Jadavian Clowney, and they didn't have it last night because he's in Tennessee now. Go real fast. They had that guy. He was just on the sidelines. It's Jamal Adams. He's ah, been their mm, best pass rusher mm. up to this point. No, I know that's not sufficient. I know. I just, I'm just saying, if Jamal Adams was in the football game, that's who fight, they would have sent on one of those drafts, on, on one of those downs. Fight okay, it. and look, I, I fight, hope they trade for someone. I hope they do. Of I'm just course, saying. <laughs> Jamal Adams out due to injury, so whenever he comes back, maybe they at least fill some of that void. Marcus, it's time to talk about some big men and how they were balling. It's time for big man balling. What do you got for us today? Okay, people, listen. Sometimes there will be a situation in big man balling where one play a big man makes makes all the other plays big men made all weekend void. And that play happened. (laughs) Now you ask Morgan, how in the hell does a wide receiver get on big man balling? Because he looked like he's 6'7", 300 pounds, and he runs a 4'2". That is DK Metcalf tracking down Buda Baker on that interception. I know you all saw it. My direct tweet was, ain't nobody tell me DK Metcalf was from Wakanda, where Black Panther was raised, because they were known for speed, known for size, and being able to do tremendous things. That's what we saw from DK Metcalf. Now, people, listen. There will be very few times... A receiver makes big man balling. But anytime DK Metcalf does something special, he breaks the mold. He is a big man who balls a lot. But in this particular situation, he made every other big man play null and void for the weekend. DK Metcalf, you made big man balling, big dog. Over 22 miles per hour for DK Metcalf. Wow. Okay, but how about this? Another poor performance from Cam Newton has us asking some questions. Will the Pats need to move the 12-1 and record? I don't know if John Gruden's aware that Cam Newton has another nickname. Yep, and it's Damn Newton. Mina, how do we say Cam Newton's name on this show? Cam Damn Newton's going to run the show. Cam Damn Newton. First thing we said when we saw him was, damn, that's a quarterback? <laughs> we talking about Cam Damn Newton. He run past your secondary at 260. You like, damn, he fast. Cam is Damn Newton. All right, so Cam's hot start had us calling him Cam Damn Newton, and then 
This happened. It was his second interception of the game against the 49ers. He obviously hadn't been the same since a hot start at the beginning of the season. He eventually was benched in the second half of yesterday's loss to the 49ers. And there was this point in the game, and it was after that second interception, where Marcus Spears and the group was texting, and, and Marcus said the dam just died. So I pointed out that at 5.28 p.m. Eastern on October 25th, the dam has died. Marcus, why did the dam die? Because I can't attribute dam to that. Um, dam is supposed to be used as a term of endearment. You guys know that. I use the word a lot. My mom doesn't even like that I use it, but I tell her I'm grown, even though she still says, I'll put these hands on you, boy. Listen, <laughs> Cam, and the way he was balling, I put the dam on the name because he was supposed to keep that trend going. It don't look good here lately, y'all. And it, it, is a, it is one of the situations where I think a lot of not knowing what team he was signed with, the length of time that it took to sign with a team. Maybe they, maybe they are smarter than us. Maybe we don't know all of the things that we need to know because it looks like a regression. And I know Dan has some stuff in Mina, but it looks like a regression, y'all. Yeah, I will say this. He still has time for the dam to come back, so you never know. He might redeem himself. You do. Uh, Cam Newton was on WEI Radio in Boston this morning reflecting himself on his poor play Sunday. Nervous? No. Scared? Absolutely not. Thinking? Now that's now that's something that I could, you know, probably finger point. And I have to get better, and I'm adamant about it. The keys to win has always been protect the football. And here I am, you know, I have yet, or we as an offense have yet to play a turnover-free game. That is the key to win. I'm not planning on just going out there and just – Yig and interceptions left and right. You know, for any any type of competitor, do you feel embarrassed? Yeah. Yeah. And I am as honest as I could possibly be right now. And the first thing I said, you know, to myself coming home, I said, you keep playing games like that, bro, and it's going to be a permanent change. It's simple. I have to play better. Let's just point and say that. Incredibly honest from Cam Newton. Dan, what do you think's going on with Cam? Well, I think the reality is this, that, um, you know, Cam for a long time was a guy that got away with poor mechanics because he was such a freak talent. And he was one of the best players in the league because of that talent. But as he's gotten older and as those hits have added up, the mechanic flaws, the mechanical flaws start to show themselves in the simple things. Like, watch his feet. I showed this last week. Watch his feet. Look how parallel they are to the line of scrimmage. Like, his feet are parallel to the line of scrimmage. His chest is completely flung open. And you can start to see that he's looking. You can see the one on his back if you're staring from the right. That should not be the case. When thrown to the left, you should have your feet a little bit staggered and driving that football as you spin almost. They spin around your lower half. And so he got away with that for a long time because, again, he was such a special talent. Now there's moments. Like you, I can point to the third quarter. He's got two straight throws in the third quarter to his left, to Bird, that are abs and one's to Jacoby Myers, that are absolute ropes. And his feet are staggered. His feet look like this instead of like this. And his body is pointed. His left shoulder is pointed to where he's throwing. So it's there, but there's just yeah. an inconsistency. And he doesn't have the talent or the health anymore to have those mechanical flaws. He looks really slow, Dan. You know, yeah. and not just like slow in every respect. Slow to release, pull the trigger, to open receivers, even when he hits them sometimes. Uh, to Myers, slow on his feet, uh, slow delivery, and. I don't like speculating about health, but there's some really strange things happening, especially when you consider how much better he looked the first two weeks of the season. Take a look at this. Over the last three weeks, Cam Newton has simply not thrown the ball to the right side of the field. I mean, he's one for eight. That's not a coincidence. And it took me back to 2019 uh, in the first two games, back when he was in Carolina. And he was coming off that Liz Frank injury. Back then, he was also not either not throwing to his right or inaccurate to his right. Now, I'm not saying those things are necessarily connected or suggesting that there's something wrong with his foot. But it's really unusual for a player to completely avoid one side of the field the way Cam Newton has over the last few weeks. I don't know why. I don't have an explanation. But he can't sustain it. Yeah, that chart is shocking there. Hey, guys, let's get some breaking news here, and we've got Adam Schefter for that. Adam, you told us we'd have an update on Kenyon Drake, and now you've got it. Yeah, Laura, we said he might miss some time, and it looks like he's going to miss a few weeks. That's what I was told. Expecting to miss a few weeks with a tear 
of the ligament in his ankle. The Cardinals are treating it like a high ankle sprain. I think this is actually good news considering because when he walked off the field last night, he heard a pop in his ankle. And the pop was that there was concern that it could be a torn ligament. That's what it is, but it's not a season-ending injury. At least it's not viewed that way at this point in time. He is expecting to miss a few weeks, and that means that while he's sidelined, Chase Edmonds becomes the featured back in Arizona. He thrived in the role last night, but that is the news that just came in moments ago. Kenyon Drake expected to miss a few weeks. Yeah, a guy like Drake who's been so riddled with injuries so many times in his career. I'm glad it's not more serious than that. Thanks so much, Shefty, for that. We'll see you on Thank Monday you. Night Countdown. And it's almost a rite of passage for a quarterback to be sacked by Aaron Donald, yet Nick Foles apparently never got the memo. Will he continue to evade the league's best pass rusher game picks are next.